Hi all, greetings for the day. This is Ayan. And we would be starting off this series on uh, projects based on ML for healthcare with Parkinson's detection. So uh, we have created these documents. Uh, basically, one of the documents has entire medical uh, information about Parkinson's disease. And there is another document which would have the technical discussions about how we are going to approach this problem. So both these documents would be shared with you. And uh, in this uh, in this first lecture, in this first lecture, I'll be giving you a brief overview of both the aspects. OK, so starting off with with the description of Parkinson's disease. So what is Parkinson's disease? So Parkinson's is a neurogenerative disorder that affects predominantly dopamine producing neurons in the specific area of the brain called substantia nigra. Now, I, I know this definition is a lot to digest, so I'll just make it simpler. So what happens is diseases like Parkinson's and autism are considered as neurodegenerative diseases. So these are the diseases of the nervous system, which which progresses over time. So these kind of diseases would uh, not, you know, suddenly impact you. It will start uh, showing symptoms gradually one hour, uh, and as the time passes, it would become a serious problem. And uh, these are mainly the change. You would see uh, changes in the behavior of a person since it's related to the neurons. There will be mainly certain changes in the behavior, physical aspect, as well as the behavioral aspect. Okay. So uh, that, uh, that is what Parkinson's is all about. And uh, uh, the symptoms of Parkinson's uh, develop slowly over the years. So uh, an algorithm, if we have an algorithm which helps us to detect it at an earlier stage, it makes things better uh, for any individual because it will help us to do an early intervention to take preventive measures. Okay. So... Uh, the uh, there are as i said uh, we have described everything in detail in this document and uh, as an overview the major uh, symptom of parkinson's disease is the tremor so what is tremor tremor is basically you would see some people uh, when they try to hold something in their hands be it a spoon be it a bowl or anything there'll be slight tremor they won't be able to hold it steadily their their hands would keep shaking so this is the tremor. This is the major symptoms of symptom of Parkinson's disease. Now, there are also other signs which which show up and uh, in all the details about we have uh, identified 10 early signs of Parkinson's disease and we have mentioned all of them in detail. We have also mentioned that what is normal. You would see uh, this line, what is normal. So what this uh, describes is other than uh, Parkinson's, there'd be other reasons for tremor as well. Okay. So uh, that's something that we have described here. And uh, for example, small handwriting, if I say small handwriting is a symptom of Parkinson's disease, uh, but small handwriting also occurs because uh, of vision related issues, stiff hands, and because someone might have been practicing how to uh, to write in small handwriting. So uh, that's what has been described here. So the data set that we are going to use for uh, Parkinson's detection is based on the sign voice, soft or low voice. So this is one of the signs of Parkinson's disease. Now our data set basically identifies uh, the changes and uh, the changes mainly in the various kinds of frequencies and amplitude of the voice of the patients who are suffer from Parkinson's disease. And these records have been noted down. So that is what forms our data set. So, uh, uh, so I'll be explaining, of course, every aspect, every attribute that has been taken into consideration in the uh, data set that we are using. So uh, that's, of course, there are uh, a lot of other signs which you can go through. And now coming to the technical part on how we are going to approach this question. And also a small description of the data set that I have already given you. So basically, uh, our data set is uh, the UCL ML Parkinson's data set. 
and uh, we will be sharing it with you, of course. It has 24 columns and 195 records. 39.7 KB is the size of the data set. So uh, in this document, you can see that we have uh, just explained that how we are going to approach this problem. So basically what we are going to do is uh, yeah, roughly, what we are going to do is we are going to load the data. We are going to pre-process the data. Then we are going to apply various algorithms and check which algorithm is working properly. And uh, that would be the model evaluation. And based on the model evaluation, we will finalize the model. So uh, in this particular project, uh, we have used XGBoost as well. So XGBoost is a new machine learning algorithm designed with speed and performance in mind. So XGBoost is extreme gradient boosting. So it's a boosting algorithm. So I hope you're familiar with the concept of uh, boosting and bagging. So XGBoost is a boosting algorithm and that would be used. And we have we are using scikit-learn library for this. So uh, this is a brief description of uh, what we are going to do the, about the project and what uh, what is the problem statement given to us. In the next video, we'll be moving on to the data set. I'll be explaining you the data set further, every attribute, and then we'll start pre-processing the data and then further we'll move on to algorithm design. So see you in the next video. Hi all. This is Ayan, welcome back. So in this video, as I had mentioned previously, we'll be starting off with loading the data and I'll be explaining to you about the data set as well. So before this, I have already given a short description on uh, what is Parkinson's and what is the approach that we are going to follow. Okay, please note that we are going to apply all the algorithms and then we are going to find out which one is the best, okay? So now, uh, Starting off, we'll start with downloading, uh, importing a few of the libraries. So we'll be importing warnings. So this uh, this particular library can be activated by writing this line, warning.filter warnings ignore. So what this does is if any kind of warnings come up, so when will the warning come up? Let's say you have uh, downloaded uh, a particular version, you have installed a particular version of any of the libraries, let's say sklearn. So you have installed an older version, but a new version has come up. So they will give you a warning saying that you're using an older version. Please use the new one. So we don't want all that coming up in the code uh, notebook. So that's why I'm uh, preventing it by writing these two lines. And now when you're implementing the code for the first time, don't apply these lines because you might get some very useful warnings. You need, need not ignore that. Okay. So uh, we are importing this for the warnings. Then we are importing NumPy for array computations. We are importing Pandas for uh, creating the data frames from the uh, for, from the files that we get. We are importing OS and Sys for system related uh, operations. We are using this library called Lux. So this is a new addition to Python. So basically what Lux does is Lux would help you. Lux would sit above Pandas and it would directly convert the attributes of the data frame into beautiful visualizations. So we would see this in action uh, very soon. And then of course we have uh, sklearn and we are going to, uh, I have imported a min-max scalar from sklearn pre-processing. I have imported XGBoost here uh, and the other algorithms we'll be importing as we'll be using them. So other than this also, we'll be using uh, a lot more libraries which we would be importing as and when required. So we are also importing the test train split from sklearn again. And we are, as of now, I have imported the uh, accuracy score as the metric. The only metric that I have imported is accuracy score. But you would see that when required, we can import other uh, metrics like F1 score, et cetera. So moving on, uh, here are a little bit of details about the data before we go into the uh, explanation about what the attributes are. So this data set was created by Max Little of University of Oxford in collaboration with National Center of Voice and Speech, Denver, Colorado, who recorded the speech signals. So what happened in this experiment was uh, patients suffering from Parkinson's as well as uh, normal people, they have recorded speeches or they have recorded their voice and uh, various parameters have been extracted from these uh, voice recordings. 
and they have been tabulated and uh, a relationship was found out between these uh, attributes of voice and the uh, onset of uh, and the uh, presence of parkinson's disease so uh, that's the reason this particular data set was selected now uh, the number of uh, rows or the number of instances in the data set is 195 the attributes are all real numbers there is no complex numbers in this there are 23 attributes so you would see uh, 23 columns basically and uh, again as i said the date of the uh, this is the date of the experiment 26 6 2008 and this is uh, majorly a classification task because we are trying to detect uh, parkinsons now it has been mentioned that there is no null values here but we have to anyhow check it out and finally there is also the file size that is 39.7 kb and this data set would be shared with you so you can find out all these features yourself in the data set as well so we will start off with loading the uh, data set from the data file that has been provided to us so we'll start off so we'll start off uh, by loading the data set so which is given to you in form of parkinsons.data so you would see the uh, make sure that the data file provided to you and the code file that you're going to uh, the in which you're going to write the code are in the same folder so what happens is you won't have to give the entire path you can just give see uh, as you can see here my data file and my code files are in the same folder so uh, i can simply write pd.readcsv pandas uh, object.readcsv and i can just keep parkinsons.data if it is in some other location you have to give the entire file location okay so if it's in uh, your desktop then you have to give something like this so desktop slash parkinsons.data now since it's in the same folder i don't have to do that okay so i'll just run it again and uh once the data is loaded here, you can see a Lux in action. So here uh, you get a toggle button. So when you press on this, it gives you various features. Okay. So for example, uh, this particular set of graphs is giving you correlations between a pair of attributes in the data set. Okay. So you can see there are 12 more charts and uh, uh, you know, this makes it a little more simpler. Of course, we will be using a heat map to find correlation better. But here you can see that there is a kind of, uh, you can see correlation between all the, all the attributes. Okay. Then there is the distribution plots, which is nothing but uh, the number of records of a particular value, uh, which would be shown up here. Okay. So these are the distribution plots, right? and uh, we have the occurrence plots as well so uh, occurrence plots will also be showing you kind of it will be showing you the same thing that the distribution is showing you so it's just you know horizontal and vertical no, nothing much different so this is lux and uh, as i said use of this library is quite optional uh, i most of the graphs that i have drawn i have uh, visualized in this particular code file it's based on uh, your matplotlib and uh, cbon Okay, so this is an optional library, right? So this is how you can load the Parkinson's data and you can check all the attributes one by one. You can uh, see the columns, you can see the visualizations if you're using Lux, of course. So the data set, as I told, there are 195 entries and 24 columns, which can be uh, easily printed out when you do a df dot shape, right? Now, let me give you a little detail about the attributes that are given to you. So uh, starting off with the first attribute, which is name. So it's nothing but it's like an ID, uh, ID number, you can say. So it's just the ASCII subject name and recording number. Basically, uh, the name and the number of recording has been combined uh, with, uh, you know, certain logic and they have created ID numbers. So it's just ID numbers and nothing else. Next, we have uh, MDVP. FO hertz. So this is basically the average uh, vocal fundamental frequency. So uh, there are three values of fundamental frequencies that are recorded average vocal fundamental frequency, maximum vocal fundamental frequency and minimum vocal fundamental frequency. So these three are uh, measures of frequency. 
okay now we have also uh, data regarding the variation in the free, uh, fundamental frequency so they are given by jitter uh, jitter is uh, mentioned in terms of percentage in terms of absolute value there is wrap there is wrap and uh, there is ppq and there is ddp so they are measures of variations in the fundamental frequency now uh, we have also the various measures of amplitude so you can see these are shimmers uh, in terms of db uh, decibels so these are measures of amplitudes now we also have uh, other attributes so other than that we have other features like an NHR and HNR, they are measures of uh, ratio of noise to tonal components of the voice. There is status. So uh, this is an important combo. So what is status basically? So status is nothing but it is it is the the dependent variable basically. So this is what is showing us whether the person is suffering from Parkinson's or not. So one is person is suffering from Parkinson and zero is the person is healthy. So in the next steps, I'll be showing you that uh, uh, how it's showing up in the data set as zeros and ones. OK, and there is also measure of nonlinear dynamical complexity. There is signal factoring scaling component. And there are three nonlinear measures of fundamental frequency variations. So uh, uh, there are there is a paper which actually describes the, uh, you know, the impact of these features on the voice. So you can refer to the below link, which has more details about computing the fundamental frequency variation spectrum in conversational spoken dialogue system. So basically from these recordings, how they have found out all these values, you can find out in this particular link here. Okay. So, uh, so here we'll be ending this particular video where we have uh, described you about the data set. And in the next video, we'll start with pre-processing the data. So see you in the next video. Hi all, welcome back. So as mentioned in this video, we'll be starting off with pre-processing the data. So as a first step in pre into pre-processing, we need to check the presence of null value in our data set. Okay. So uh, if you had have observed previously, it's mentioned that there are no missing values in the data set, but what happens is there are different definitions to missing values. Usually, if a column is left em empty, it's a missing value. Yeah, that's for sure. But sometimes the column is filled with characters like question mark or stars. So these also are actually null values. But uh, initially, if you uh, use this particular line, df dot is null dot sum, which I have used for our data frame, you can see that it's showing zeros, right? So there, there is no null value. But we need to observe if there are any characters like question marks or star in the col columns, which would also, which would not show up here. Okay. So as the first process, let's focus on this, right? So as I said, we start off with using uh, df dot is null dot sum. So this would give you the list of if there is a empty column, it would show up here. Now here, what I have done is I have found out the data types of the uh, attributes. Okay. So I use df dot uh, d types, and you can see all the attributes. So here you can observe that other than name, almost uh, everything else is showing as floats and int. Int there is one int, and rest of it is all float, right? So uh, the if there is any character like question mark or star being used, it would show up as a string. So it would affect you know this particular output. So this is one way to figure out whether there is a character or not. Anyhow, you have to find out the data types first. So uh, next, what you can do is you can find out the unique values in the column. So what will happen if you find unique values in the column? One of the uh, major aspect is you would come to know whether the given data is logically in this range or not. Okay. So it would help you in a lot of ways. It will help you in detecting if there is an outlier quite easily, it will, you can find it out. Secondly, it will also help you detect if there are characters which are not supposed to be there in the column, uh, like question marks or anything like that. And also any kind of spelling mistakes or things like that might come up like 
you know if uh, if mail is written as m a l e and uh, someone is uh, giving an entry with a capital uh, with a capital m but the other person is giving an entry with a sh shorthand m so what happens is python would detect that as a different character okay so uh, if that happens let's say uh, there is a gender column there it should only have males and females but now it would have male with a capital m females and there would be male with a small m okay so that would affect your uh, overall algorithm so we don't want that to happen so that's something that we need to observe now uh, how do you do that there is a method there is a df dot n, n unique which can be used so here what i am doing is i uh, uh, let me show you what df dot columns does so let me add a cell above this so df dot columns basically shows you gives you a list of all the columns so what i am doing here is i am iterating through this list so for i in df dot columns if i print i you would see that i am iterating through the names of the columns right so i am getting the names of the columns now i need to find out uh, let's say i need to find out the uh, unique values in pp okay so how do i do that if i do df square bracket pp dot to list what happens here all the values in the column is converted to a list right now if i convert this to a set then automatically i'll get the unique values because set would remove duplicates right so i'll get the unique value now combining these two logics what i have done is i have iterated through the column list and i have printed the set dfi dot to list okay so here you can see on printing you will get all the unique values now the name column is of course uh, you know the id column so it would be all unique so that's okay that is not a problem you can ignore it so i have just made it a little better you know by putting the star and i have uh, uh, inside you will see the name of the column as well so here you can see there are uh, these unique values coming up for every column right now moving down you can see that here it, it would be easy for you to observe if there is a question mark or something like that some character like that okay because that would show up quite easily and here you can see the status which is the person is suffering from parkinson's or not, not that is shown as 0 and 1 right so in this way you can print all the unique values right so this is your first step now in the next step we will be uh, checking the label imbalance okay so i'll be explaining that to you in the next video hi all welcome back so in this video we will be discussing about uh, label imbalance and data distributions so uh, what is label imbalance basically uh, since this is a classification task the label column or the dependent variable will have either you know two unique values or three unique values if there is a multi uh, you know multi label classification there will be more than two unique values so uh, let's say you have two values as in this case there are two labels one is showing uh, the one represents that the person is suffering from parkinson's and zero represents that they are not and let's say that uh, when the experiment was conducted the treatment group and the uh, control group were not balanced suppose during the experiment what happened was uh, more number of people came up without parkinson's and less number of people with parkinson's so when the record was made there would be an imbalance in the data okay so what you have to do is for all this classification task you have to find out the label imbalance so you can easily visualize it through this particular code that i have written here so what i am doing is i am using as i said matplotlib and seaborn for visualizations so the status column is having our labels so what i am doing is i am writing this code df dot status dot uh, value counts so this would give me it's like a counter if you're familiar with uh, the counter what what does counter do if you feed a list to the counter it would give you a dictionary which would have the value and the number of value as the key and the number of repetitions as the value of the dictionary right so it will form a dictionary like that 
So here, what value count does is it forms a data frame, which would have the status or that is zero and one in one column. And the other column would give us the count of how many zeros and how many ones are occurring. Okay. So we are creating a temporary data frame here and this temporary data frame. So this temporary data frame, which you see here, I have, uh, sorry. So this temporary data frame I have put into another data frame so that it looks good. So what I, I'll do is so that it becomes more clear to you, I'll insert a cell above and I'll show you what this particular code does. Okay. So let me just uh, show you this df dot status dot value counts. Okay. So if I run this, you can see, so you can see it shows number of ones and number of zeros. Now, uh, what I'm doing is the index I'm taking as one column and the values as other column, and I'm making a new data frame from it. So that is what temp df is. So if I run this code here, it's okay. So uh, I, I'm taking these two lines. Okay. So I'm taking these two lines and you can see how the temp df looks now. So this is nothing but it's basically a data frame, right? So it's a data frame with status one zeros and values here. So, okay. So it comes like this. Now, what you can do is you can just uh, go with a bar plot. So the bar plot will clearly show you the difference in the labels. So that is what I'm using the C bond, C bond bar plot I'm using where the X would be the status and Y would be the value, the column names and the data is TMTF, which is formed above. Okay. So here you can see there is a label imbalance. So number of ones is more in this case. So the number of people who have uh, been, uh, who have come for this experiment, most of them had Parkinson's. Okay, so you can see this is more, right? So what happens here is if an algorithm is feeded data this way, that uh, there are more records of ones and less records of zero, the algorithm would consider that every value that, because the algorithm would work on a metric. So let's say I set the metric to frequent, uh, to accuracy. So every time it would say that, okay, when I'm marking uh, a, a data input as one, it is matching the output, right? So most of the cases ones are matching. So if I give one as output for everything, then my accuracy score would be high. So that's what happened. So the model misinterprets. So it misses a lot of patterns and hence all the values which are actually supposed to be marked as zeros would be marked as one. So that would lead to an error and you don't want that. So we need to work on this part. We need to make sure that there is a label, uh, there is a balance, right? So that's the reason we are visualizing it here. Now uh, we would be handling this in some time in this part. I just showed you the label imbalance and explained you the importance of it. Okay. So uh, this is about label imbalance. Now uh, in the next video, I'll be describing you about the distribution of the data and what kind of distribution of data is favorable for any of the algorithms that we are going to use. So see you in the next video. Hi all, welcome back. So in the previous video, I had described you about the label imbalance. In this video, we'll find out the distribution of the data. So basically how is uh, the column values of all the attributes distributed, right? So it's an important component of uh, data science. Uh, so what I have done here is I have uh, created a pair plot initially, okay? So, uh, you know, it's pair plot is obviously a little uh, confusing. So it's not very favorable here. What pair plot does is it gives you a rough idea of the distribution of data, not just within itself, but uh, with respect to other attributes as well. So that is something that pair plot does. So here you can see the whites that you see here. So that is actually the status column. Okay. So that is the relationship with the status column. So that's what I have drawn the pair plot for. So you can see how the data is distributed roughly. But of course, uh, when there, there's a huge amount of data, it becomes very confusing as you can see here. So it's a little difficult to interpret. So what we want to do is we want to find the distribution of each and every column that we have. Now, uh, if you remember correctly, there is an ID column here, right? So there is an ID column, which is all unique values and which is not, which is a non-numerical column, right? So these are all string values. 
So you don't really want the distribution of that. So you need to find the distribution of the numerical columns, right? So uh, what I have done is I have used the distribution plot method of Seaborn. So uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to first show you what this particular set of code does, okay? So if you wanna find the distribution of a particular column, what you do is SNS dot this plot. So this would show you the distribution plot, data frame name and the data frame column, okay? So let's do it for uh, one of the columns. Let's select uh, a column randomly. Okay, so let's select any one of this. So I'll go with, okay, I'll go with this jitter, right? Jitter colon DDP. So let me just, uh, okay, otherwise I'll go with PP. It will be simpler, okay? So let's go with this particular distribution. Okay, let's see how it looks. Okay, so this is how the distribution of PP looks. Now uh, you want to do this for uh, every column, okay? So you don't really want to repeat this uh, step every time. So what you can do is you can add a function for it. So instead of doing it for one column, I want to do it for all the columns. So I'll add a function, say displot, okay? Which would take the column name as the attribute, as the parameter, sorry, and what I'll do is I'll use this particular line, of course, for plotting. So SNS dot displot. And instead of the column name, uh, I mean, by instead of hard coding the column name, I'll put the column. So here we'll be giving the column as the parameter and that would be taken here. And the, uh, uh, the only thing there is no returning from this, there is just uh, plotting. So I'll just go with plt dot show, okay? Right, so you wanna test your function, right? So I'll just go for this and I'll be calling the function here. So this plot bracket, as I said, we'll be giving the PPE, right? So in quotes, PPE. So it's working, right? So since we have written this function, what we can do is we can just, again, follow the same logic that we followed for uh, finding the unique values. We'll loop through the data frame columns. Now, what have I done here exactly? I have converted this to a list and then I have removed the first value because the first uh, name is actually the ID, right? I don't want that. So I have removed that, right? So how I have done that one quote. So this particular part would remove that. And then this function has been applied to each and every column and you can see all the plots have been formed, okay? Now, why do I need to plot the distribution? So basically uh, in any kind of uh, machine learning related modeling, we try to make sure that the algorithm we make or the algorithm that we apply is applicable for the whole population. So we consider that the data set that we have is a sample out of the whole population and after, uh, you know, after we make the algorithm, we make sure that that algorithm is applicable for the entire population. Now for that to happen as per central limit theorem, we need to make sure that the distribution that we are using initially, the sample that we are using, the data in the sample should be normally distributed or it should follow a Gaussian distribution. So you would see that almost all the columns are following a Gaussian distribution. So of course, you won't get the textbook like perfect Gaussian bell curve. You would be seeing distortion, but they should at least follow it to a certain extent. So you can see everywhere there is a Gaussian plot, almost a Gaussian plot. Of course, now there is a certain amount of skewness and crutosis. So there is no crutosis here, but there is a bit of right skew. So that can be fixed, of course, not an issue. And there are somewhere where there are double curves, but you would see that almost everything is normally distributed. So we are good to go with the data set and this, uh, the algorithms that we create would be applicable for the population, right? So this is all about the distribution. Now in the next video, we'll be discussing about outliers, detection and removal of outliers. So see you in the next video. Hi all, welcome back. So in the previous video, we had discussed about the distribution plots. And in this video, we'll be discussing about the 
detection and removal of outliers. Okay. So what is an outlier basically? So outlier is a value which is either too high compared to all other data available in the column or too low compared to all the data available in the column. Okay. So in short, it's a value which should not be there in the column whose presence would actually affect your algorithm. Okay. So that is what an outlier is. So the best way to detect outlier is by using box plots. Now, always remember that uh, when you're applying algorithms or logics like box plotting, so box plot follows the five point summary of the data. So what is the five point summary? It would uh, detect the median, the quartile one, the quartile three, the minimum and the maximum value. Okay. Now make sure that although after this, you would be getting all the plot and it would be showing you the outliers, make sure that whether it is really an outlier or not. So that has to be confirmed for that. You need to have the domain knowledge. Okay. So very often uh, the algorithm would show something as an outlier, but practically that can happen. So you need to keep that in mind. Okay. So we need to have a little bit of practical approach, but anyhow, uh, what we are going to do is we are going to plot a box plot and we are going to see uh, the presence of outliers in the columns. Okay. So again, what I'm doing is I'm using the SNS.boxplot method, the same logic that we followed for the distribution curve. So what I have done is again, I have written a function and then I have iterated through the column and I have applied the function. But here, one difference is uh, we are doing box plot. Now box plot is uh, not applicable for object. So what is an object like string? Okay, so it should, it is applicable only for integer and float values, right? So uh, we do have uh, the object here, which is the name, right? So as I had mentioned the uh, ID column, so we don't want to include that. So again, I have, what I have done is I have done select D types and I have excluded objects. Plus I have also done this. So remove the first column just in case. Okay. So if there is any other object in the data frame, it would be ignoring it. And uh, the first column, of course, we would be ignoring this line itself is sufficient. You don't really have to put this up. You would be getting the output anyways. So by doing this, you can see that we are getting all the box plots for all the numerical columns and there are outliers everywhere, right? So you can see the outliers here. So there are a lot of outliers, right? So now if I look at this NHR, so what is happening here? Here you would see almost most of the points are shown as outliers, but if you observe the research paper and if you go by what the people who have made this data set say that these values are not outliers. They are acceptable values. Okay. So you don't really have to worry much about it. Right. So here also you can see, and you can see here there is, you know, this is a different kind of plot. So this is a status plot actually. So this is a dependable variable. So you cannot really, you need not do this. You need not use this box plot. It's a dependent variable. It's the status column. Okay. And you can see all the box plots have been created, right? So here we are not removing any uh, data, mainly because uh, the people who made this data set, they have said that there are no outliers. All the values that you see in the column are possible values. So although uh, by five point summary of the data, it is showing as an outlier, it is not. So we are not going to remove it, but this is a standard procedure that you need to follow to make sure that there is no actual outlier in the data, okay? So this is about outlier uh, removal. So in the uh, upcoming projects, you will see that we'll be using techniques like IQR, Z, uh, Z values, etc., to remove outliers. Then I'll be, of course, explaining you to those things in detail. And followed by this in the next video, I'll be explaining you about the correlation between the values. And I'll be explaining you about the heat map, which would be used to represent the correlation and how we are going to remove them. Okay, so see you in the next video. Hi all, welcome back. So as I mentioned previously, in this video, we'll be discussing about uh, correlation. So what is correlation? So how much does shift in a particular set of data affect another set of data? So that is a layman's uh, way of explaining correlation. So basically, Correlation has a major effect on the outputs of the algorithms. So why does that happen? So if you're familiar with uh, 
with algorithms like uh, uh, linear regression, logistic regression, etc. These are rule based algorithms. So they tend to develop an equation, a mathematical model. Now, uh, let's say there is correlation between two values. Let's say that uh, the mathematical relation that has been developed is something like this y is equal to ax, ax1 plus uh, bx2 plus so on plus f. Okay, so you have something like this. Now, if x1 and x2 are correlated, so what happens uh, when x1 and x2 are correlated? There is a correlation coefficient rho which would do this. So x1 would now become rho times x2, right? So this is what would happen, right? And after the algorithm finds this out, what happens is x1 would be dependent on x2 in this way. So I can simply replace this as a multiplied by rho multiplied by x2. So this would impact the weight that has been given to x2, right? So you don't want this to happen. So, so you don't want this to happen. So that's the reason we need to avoid any kind of correlation between the data. So that is what we are looking at here. So the best way to represent correlation is usually considered to be a heat map, which you see right here. So this is actually the heat map. So one thing that has to be kept in mind is the in independent variables, which would be uh, given to you, they should be highly correlated to the dependent variable. So in our case, the dependent variable is the status, right? Which is showing one when the person has Parkinson's and zero when the person does not have Parkinson's. So that is the status column. Now, the status column should have a good amount of correlation with all the independent variables, but there should not be high correlation between the independent uh, variables, right? So that is something that we have to observe. So here, what I have done is I have uh, uh, found out the correlation using Pearson's correlation. So this is the method of Pearson's correlation. So df.corr would simply find, uh, give you all the correlations. And I am using this particular value inside the heat map method. So sns.heatmap and I, we can find the correlation. Now, this particular parameter that you see here, annotations to be set as true. What this does is in every cube, it would be mentioning the actual value of the correlation, right? So there is a scale here. So the darker the color, the lower the correlation, the lighter the color, the higher the correlation. You can see this is going towards one. Starting from uh, zero, it's going towards one, okay? So looking at the data, you need to make sure that there is not a very high correlation between any two independent values, okay? So uh, that is something that you need to observe and you need to uh, eliminate those kind of correlations. So what happens is if you see that there is high correlation between say uh, jitter percentage and jitter absolute, which is obviously going to happen because they are same data with different units. So you need to make sure that you do not keep both. You need to keep one of them, okay? So here you can see uh, jitter and absolute value. There is a 0 0.94 correlation right? So you need to remove them. Okay. So these kind of things have to be observed from the heat map. So here, if you observe the status column here, you can see there's a status column. Okay. So uh, it doesn't matter how much status column is correlated with uh, all the other attributes. Okay. So that doesn't really matter, but uh, other things have to be kept in mind. Okay. So that is what the heat map would show you. So this is the heat map basically. So this would show you this particular kind of output. And always remember that you have to eliminate uh, the column which has a higher amount of correlation. So out of there, you have to judge. So if there are three columns and let's say these three columns, you will see that these two are having 0 0.94. And then you have to judge between whether I should keep this on this based on how this these columns are correlated with other columns. Okay, so this would, uh, you have to think about it and you have to eliminate those columns. So that is all about uh, correlations, right? So in the next video, what we'll do is we'll start by, we'll start to prepare our data for applying it into our algorithms.
and uh, we would be handling things like label imbalancing, scaling, etc. So see you in the next video. Hi all, welcome back. So uh, in this video, as I said, we will be uh, preparing our data to be applied on the algorithms. So we will start off by creating the dependent and the independent variables, right? So as I've been mentioning since the very beginning that status is our dependent variable. So your dependent variable is something that you're going to estimate with the help of your algorithm. So here uh, it, it is usually represented by Y. So here I have mentioned X and Y. So what is X? X is all the columns except the status column because status is the dependent variable. Now you would see that I have dropped another column name. So why have I done that? So basically name is an ID column. So it's a primary key of the table, which is basically going to be unique value for every row, right? So you don't really want that to be part of your algorithm. That is a completely unnecessary column. So that's the reason I am dropping the name column. Okay. So here I have dropped the name and I have dropped the status from X, right? And I have used the status as the dependent variable. So here in Y, I have used the status, right? So this is how you make your X and Y. Now moving on, uh, we need to do the label balancing. So we had checked previously on top here that there is a label imbalance, right? So in the very beginning, if you remember it, so it's uh, here after the after we found the unique values. You can see here there is a label imbalance that I had shown, right? So it's time that we fix that. Okay. So how do we fix it? So we use uh, the IMB Learn. So IMB Learn library is basically used for uh, label balancing. So it has methods of oversampling and undersampling. So what is oversampling basically? So what happens is as I had uh, shown you in the graph also here also you can see. I have used a counter. So uh, by using counter, I have found out how many ones and how many zeros are there in the list, which is of course shown by the graph also. So here you can see zeros are less and one is more. So in oversampling, what happens is we use the k-means clustering method. And basically uh, the algorithms use the k-means clustering method and it creates a set of points around these points, which are, uh, you know, in lesser in number. So around zero, uh, around these points, it would form more points. Okay. So basically it would be uh, oversampling, creating more samples randomly. So uh, that's something that random oversampler does and random undersampler, uh, what would random undersampler do? It would just reduce the number of ones. Okay. So uh, I would always recommend to go with the oversampler so that you do not lose important data from your data set. Okay. So now I have shown you the counter here to see how, uh, what it was initially. And now I'll be calling in the random oversampler object and I'll be fitting the X and Y into the random oversampler. Okay. And now you can see here that when I use the same counter method here, it's showing 147 and 48, but here it has balanced both. So there is 147 and 147. Okay. So this is what the random oversampling is for. So here we have uh, fixed the label imbalance, right? So in the next step, I'll be discussing about scaling and why scaling the data is important. Okay. See you in the next video. Hi all, welcome back. So in the previous step, uh, we have done the oversampling part to eliminate the label imbalance. In this step, what we are going to do is we are going to scale the data. Okay. So uh, why is scaling done basically? So scaling is recommended to in order to avoid overfit on, with the models. Okay. So uh, if the data is not scaled, so what does scaling do? Scaling brings the data under a certain interval. Okay. So there are different methods. So there is a min max scalar, there is a standard scalar. So these kind of methods are used. They bring the data within the certain interval. So this kind of ensures that there is no overfit when we are fitting the data into the model. So that is the importance of scaling. So uh, in this scenario, I am using the min max scalar. So what I am doing is the min, uh, what min max scalar does is it uh, transforms the data and fits it between the certain provided interval. 
So you can provide an interval. You can provide say zero to one. You can provide minus in minus uh, one to one, minus two to two. So these kind of intervals you can provide. So here I am providing minus one to one. Okay. So in min max scalar, it would bring your data to between minus one to one. If you use the standard scalar, what it would do is it would uh, convert your uh, Gaussian distribution into a standard Gaussian distribution. So basically, it would bring the mean of the uh, column to zero and standard deviation to one. So that is what standard scalar does. In this case, I'm using the min max scalar. So uh, min max scalar I had imported earlier from sklearn.preprocessing. So I am just calling the min max scalar object and I have mentioned uh, previous as mentioned previously, we are scaling it, scaling the entire data between the interval minus one to one. Okay. So basically uh, every value which you see. So here what, what happens is the maximum value in the data set would be found out. That would be made as one. And the minimum uh, uh, value in the data set would be found out. That would be made as minus one. And all the data would be uh, collected between these two intervals. Okay. So we are convert, we are just uh, scaling and we are fitting all the independent variables into it. Okay. So you need not scale the dependent variable that is not required. So dependent variable in case of classification anyways, be between, you know, it would be something like zero, one, two, three. So you don't really have to do the scaling there. So you have to scale for the independent variable. So that is what has been done in this step. Now, as you can see here, there are 24 columns, right? So that is still less, but there will be data sets which will have thousands and thousands of columns. So in those kind of cases, it's a little tedious for any algorithm to fit that much amount of data. It would consume a lot of computational power and uh, it might also affect the performance of the algorithm as a whole. So to prevent that from happening, we use feature engineering techniques. So there are a lot of uh, feature engineering techniques. So two of the very popular one are PCA, the principal component analysis and the LDA. So we will be using uh, these two feature engineering techniques before fitting uh, our data into the model. Now, uh, in this particular project, I have started off with PCA. And uh, what I have done is the PCA, using PCA, you can have uh, a particular amount of variance retained. So what does that mean? That means you mentioned that I am doing a principal component analysis and I want to uh, I want to retain 95% of the variance, right? So you want to retain that much amount of variance. The data you have should ha have that much amount of variance with respect to the original data. So that is what I have done here. So uh, what I have done is I have uh, called PCA from uh, SKLN decomposition, And I have mentioned that I want a 0.95% variance retained, okay? So you can make it to 90%, 98%, anything you like. So I'm keeping it to 95%. So when I transform the data here, so PCA.fit transform I have used, I am again here. We need not do it for the dependent variable. We only have to do it for independent variable. So I have done that. And here I'm actually showing you what PCA does, the role, actual role of PCA. So you can see the original uh, set of independent variable has a shape of 294,22. Okay, so there are 22 columns, right? But when we apply PCA, that has been reduced to eight columns, right? So what does that mean? We need, we need eight columns to keep 95% of the variance. So that is what has been done here. So this has significantly reduced the dimensionality of the data which is very, very beneficial. It saves a lot of computing time as well. Okay. And after doing this, what I have done finally is I have split the data into test and train. Okay. So uh, here uh, you can see, I have used the test train split method and I have split the data, which I have, uh, uh, which for which we have done PC and for which we have done scaling and we have split it to test and train. Okay. So what I have done is uh, I have set the test size to 0 0.2, which means 20% is the testing data and 80% is the training data. So that has been done here. Now, uh, in the next step, what we are going to do is we are going to up, uh, we are going to fit this data into 
a lot of rule based algorithms and we are going to figure out uh, the accuracy based on which we would be selecting a, a proper model. Okay, so that is what we are going to do in our next video. So see you there. Hi all, welcome back. So as mentioned previously, we have uh, pre-processed our data until now. What we have done is we have pre-processed our data. We have uh, um, we have fixed the label imbalance. We have scaled the data. We have done the feature engineering by, and reduced the dimensions as well. And then we have split the data into test and train. So that has been done up until now. And now we are going to fit this pre-processed data into algorithms and we are going to figure out the accuracy and we are going to see how well these algorithms are performing and based on that we'll be selecting the best algorithm so uh, since this is the first uh, project in this set of videos what we have done is we have used rule based algorithms so in this phase we'll be uh, using rule based algorithms like logistic regression svc random forest decision tree etc and uh, we are not using any kind of neural networks for this particular set in the upcoming videos, of course, I'll be uh, describing you with the help of uh, neural networks and we'll be doing further study on it. Okay. So in this, the approach that I have followed is I have created, I have first imported the metrics. So there I had just imported the accuracy score, but here what I have done is I have imported the required metrics, which is the uh, confusion metrics, the accuracy score, F1 score, precision score and recall score. Okay. And uh, we would also be plotting the ROC curves. These would help us in model evaluation. We'll also be plotting the ROC curve, which would make it even clear. Okay, the model evaluation would be done further better with that. So before we do that, let's first create uh, our algorithms. Let's uh, fit the data and let's uh, record the accuracies. Okay, so I have created two lists here. Okay, so there is an accuracy list, which would basically contain uh, all the accuracy values, right? And there is a method list. So what is the method list gonna contain? It's gonna contain the name of the algorithm that has been used. So uh, basically what happens here is I'm going to import the algorithm from Escalon, then I'm going to fit the data, and then I'm going to make a prediction using the test value, and then I'm going to find the accuracy score. This accuracy scores I'll be appending in the list, in this accuracy list. Similarly, the name of the methods I'll be appending in the uh, method list. And I'll also be making another list which would be having the uh, model, which would be having the saved models, okay? So to start off with, we have, uh, I will be explaining you only one of the algorithms and uh, others are all self-explanatory after that. So we'll start off with logistic regression. So how do we do this? So basically uh, we import logistic regression. We create our model logistic regression. We provide the hyperparameters. So I've set C to 0 0.4 max iteration to thousand and the solver has been set as lib linear. So I hope you have uh, a, very, a little bit of idea about what the solvers and iterations does. So after we create the model, uh, we have fit the data, the X train and the Y train into the model. Okay, and after the fitting is complete, what we are doing is we are making a prediction. So why predict we have found out, which is found found out by passing uh, by passing on the X test, okay, onto the classifier. So the classifier is basically our model, right? And then we are using the accuracy score to find the accuracy. Now accuracy score takes two parameters, the Y predict, that is the predicted value and the Y test, which is the actual value. Okay, and we get the accuracy. So accuracy LR is accuracy of logistic regression. Similarly, the same approach is followed for decision tree also. Okay, so you'll see the same approach. We have accuracy decision tree. Now, uh, moving forward to random forest classifier, there are two criteria available for random forest classifier. One is the uh, Gini index or, or one is the entropy, right? And the other is the information gain. So. Uh, I have basically written models for both of them. Okay. And then we have used SVC, we have used K nearest neighbors, and we have used the naive base algorithm. So both of them, there is Gaussian naive base and there is Bernoulli naive base. So we have used both these algorithms. And finally, we have used a 
voting classifier as well. So basically what voting classifier does is it takes up all these classifiers that I have uh, created previously and it will combine them. It will find out the uh, best outcome. So it's like a bagging al algorithm. Okay. So it's going to do the bagging part, right? So again, uh, uh, it is also following the same procedure. We are calling the model and we are fitting the data and we are making the prediction. Now, uh, as I said, we have created three lists. Okay. So list one has the names of the algorithms. List two has the accuracy values of the algorithms. List three has the models. So these are the trained models, classifier one, classifier three, etc. So these are our trained models, right? Now what I'm doing is I'm creating a data frame. So this data frame is having the method used uh, in the in one of the columns, it is having method use and accuracy in the other column. So I have printed the data frame and you can see the data frame here. So this is the data frame. So here basically I have uh, made a data frame which is having the method use and the accuracy. Okay, so algorithm and the accuracy. Okay, so you can see it here. Now I am using this data frame again to plot a bar chart. Okay. So the bar chart would make it more clear. The visualization would make it more clear that uh, which algorithm is performing better, right? So that's what I have done. I have created the visualization and here you can see the uh, data frame and the visualization, okay? So here you can see a uh, random forest information gain method, entropy method, SVM and KNN are actually performing the best, okay? Now, this best is only in terms of accuracy score, but this is a classification algorithm. So the accuracy score alone is not enough. We of course need to find out the true positive and false positive rates. We have to create the confusion metrics, right? So that is something which is required because uh, in a healthcare project, the true, uh, the false positive and the uh, false negative values are going to impact uh, a person's uh, health. So if you're using this algorithm and you're predicting something like, uh, okay, this person is not going to suffer from Parkinson's, but uh, you would actually see that the person starts suffering from Parkinson's. So that is a false negative. You don't want that to happen. Similarly, if the person is uh, not going to suffer from Parkinson's, but your algorithm says that, yes, they are going to suffer from Parkinson's, it's a false positive. You don't want that either because then a wrong medication would start for the patient. So those are the things that have to be kept in mind. And uh, that is why we are going to do further model evaluations. Okay. So that would be done in the next video. So see you there. So uh, as, uh, as I had mentioned in initially while explaining about the project, so we are going to use uh, XGBoost classifier as well. So previously in, in our previous video, I had mentioned to you about the voting classifier, which works similar to a bagging classifier, right? But uh, I'm also going to show you a boosting classifier, the XGBoost, okay? So basically the methods are the same. So again, uh, we call the XGBoost object and then we fit the data, right? So we have done this this way, same way. We have fit the data and then we have made prediction and we have uh, printed the accuracy, okay? So what I'm going to do is the model evaluation part, uh, I'll be explaining you in detail for this particular XGBoost algorithm, okay? And then we would be using that knowledge to loop through the list that we had created previously, like right? We had created this list. So we'll be using those lists and we would be using a uh, looping method to apply these uh, model evaluation process to all the algorithms, okay? So I'll be explaining you in detail how we are doing this for our XGBoost, right? So as I said, we have uh, found the accuracy score here, right? And now we are going to call upon the confusion metrics. Right. So we are calling upon the confusion metrics. All the processes are the same. You call the confusion metrics. 
it takes two well it takes two values one is the uh, actual value which is the y test and the other one is the y predict okay so this is basically nothing but y predict so i have replaced y predict with model xg dot predict x test so that is what y predict is you can see it's here right so why have i done this because uh, we are going to use loops and we don't really want to create another, another variable if you're going to use the loops okay so here you can find out the confusion metrics in the similar way you can find out the f1 score as well so this extra uh, parameter that you see here is binary because it's a you know it's a binary classification so that's why we have mentioned it as binary right so this is how you can find the f1 score and you can actually if you don't uh, really want to use you know individual metrics like this you can go for the classification report so what would the classification report do it would show you all the evaluation metrics so it will show you precision recall f1 score and support and it would also show you accuracy macro average and weighted average okay so that's what i have done here so the same process which was followed for f1 score and for confusion metrics so you just have to put the actual value and the predicted value okay so that is what your classification report would show here so this is how the classification report is formed and uh, the confusion metrics which i had created earlier i have printed that as well okay so here you can see the true positive and true negative are okay we, you don't really have to worry about this what you have to worry about are these values right so this is the uh, false negative and the false positive right so those are the two things that you have to worry about so that is kind of less so it's uh, okay it, it won't be much of a problem right so this is the code i have shown you this code because i'm i want to show you how it works individually now what i'm going to do is i'm going to loop through the list that i had created earlier so that it becomes easy for us to apply these methods on every algorithm to get the uh, summary for every algorithm the metrics for every algorithm okay so here's how it goes so what is list 3 so list 3 is the one that we created here so list 3 contains the trained models okay so the model has been trained uh, right it has been fitted with the training data and it has been saved here okay so that is in your list 3 right so what am i doing here exactly i'm iterating through list 3 so for i in list 3 that means i would start taking the models i am printing the i i am printing the model that has been trained and then I'm printing the classification report for every model. Okay. And I'm also printing the confusion metrics for every model. Okay. So that is what I'm doing. So CM. So uh, what I can do is instead of, you know, uh, using CM, which I think uh, it's an error because it's just taking the CM value, which has been calculated here from this CM. So we won't do that. What we'll do is we'll take this. Okay. So this is the formula for, this is the, uh, you know, uh, fitting into the library, right? And as I said, Y test and uh, we're, we are reading the models from the list, right? So I can just say I dot predict, right? So if you do this, we will get the confusion metrics for every, every algorithm that has been used, right? So this is something, this is how I, I uh, did this because I wanted to show you how this uh, loop has been written. Okay. So basically looping through the data, I'm just printing out the classification report and the confusion metrics for every algorithm. So you can see it here. So it's printing like this. So logistic regression, what is the classification report? What is the confusion metrics? Again, decision tree, the same thing. Classification report, confusion metrics. Okay. So we have done this for all the algorithms so that you can check and you can figure out which is better, which should be used. Okay. So that is what we have done here. Now, the final step, of course, for evaluation is the ROC curve, right? So that ROC curve we'll be discussing in the next video. So welcome back. So as I mentioned previously, the final step in model evaluation is the ROC curve. 
So the ROC curves gives you a better idea of how well your model has performed. So basically what happens is there is a line here. So basically the axis are the true positive rate and the false positive rate. And there is a line. This line basically represents true positive rate equal to false positive rate. And then you will get start getting curves which are above the this particular line. Okay. So the closer that line is to this particular line, the worse the model is, the farther away those the curve goes from this line, the better is the model. Okay. So that is what ROC curve does. Okay. So receive operating characteristics. Uh, that is what it does. And area under the curve, that is AUC, is nothing but the area under the receiver operating characteristic curve. Okay. So we are going to uh, plot that first. So how are we going to do that? Again, the sklearn has existing methods for it, ROC curve, AUC, and uh, these are all again confusion metrics and all, right? So we import ROC curve and AUC, right? And then we find the probabilities, model dot predict probability, and we can just fit in the uh, test, right? So we get the probabilities. So that becomes our prediction now. And from the, that prediction, we are going to fit that prediction and the Y test, that is the actual output into the ROC curve. So here, what we get is false positive rate, true positive rate, and the threshold value, right? And then you can find the area under the curve by fitting false positive rate and true positive rate into the AUC method, okay? So I hope uh, you have certain idea about the mathematics behind it because that is, uh, uh, I'm not going to explain that. So I hope you have the idea of the mathematics behind this method, okay? So in this way, we can of course find the ROC AUC. And then again, what I have simply done is I have used uh, matplotlib. So I've set the title and I have plotted these values. So you can see here, I have put the legend in the lower right, right? And we have plotted the true positive rate and the false positive rate. So you'll get the ROC curve. Now I have put all this method, all this into a function. And what I have done is I have used the same iteration method above and I have fitted the data along with the algorithm use into this ROC function. So you can see this function takes input as model X test and Y test, right? So the testing data and the model. So that is what I have used here, okay? In this case, I have uh, used the range method, right? So for I in range is giving me the index values. Why have I done this? Because I wanted to print, you know, the name of the algorithm. So that is why the list one contains the name of the algorithm and list three contains the saved model. So basically on the saved model, I am applying the ROC, plot ROC function. And from the name, I'm just printing the name, okay? So you can see all the ROC curves have been formed, right? So from this, you can see uh, which one is performing better. So, uh, so this is what brings us to the end of the coding part. In the next video, we'll be describing our intuitions regarding the models. So see you in the next video. Hi all, welcome back. So uh, up until the last video, we have uh, completed the coding part of the project where we have uh, pre-processed the data. We have fit the data into various models and we have also printed the metrics and evaluation parameters of the model. The last step left is to find out which model is best suitable for this particular project, which of the models that we have used is showing us the best results, okay? So starting off uh, here, if you remember when we made, uh, when we fitted the data into the model, we had calculated accuracies, right? So from the accuracy values, you would see that logistic regression is performing poorly with an accuracy of 72.88 percentage. And uh, you would see these three algorithms, random forest information gain and random forest based on entropy rule and information rule. They are performing good. Also, SV, SVM and KNN are also performing good. And you would see that naive base, the Bernoulli naive base, as well as the Gaussian naive base are not performing very well compared to the other algorithms, okay? 
but always remember that uh, naive base and gaussian naive base and bernoulli naive base are based on naive base algorithm and as well as the multiplication rule of probability so these are uh, the uh, the kind of accuracy given by these models are always much better than any other rule based algorithm but of course that depends on the data mathematically of course they have an edge over other algorithms but it also depends on the data and various other parameters so we would not just keep accuracy as the major parameter as i said this is a classification task and this is being done for a medical project so we need to make sure that we uh, keep into consideration the true positive and the false positive values as well so that is something that we have to keep in mind so since the false positive and true positive false positive and false negative values play an important role in this kind of a prediction project so what we do is we go with other other model evaluations we go with the confusion metrics we go with the f1 score etc and we make sure that the model is performing well under all circumstances okay so uh, if you as you know that we have used the classification report and we have used the confusion metrics as well so now let's compare these uh, these evaluations that we had done okay so this one is for xg boost you can see the precision recall and f1 score values right and you can see the confusion metrics where you will see that the true positive and the true negative are okay of course they do not really uh, they are not really of concern there is one false negative and there are two false positive values right when we use xg boost algorithm okay now moving on to logistic regression you can see that it has obviously it has lower accuracy which we had seen previously and you can see the precision recall and all also which is also if you observe here the recall with zero for xg boost is equal to the recall with zero for logistic regression right so that is something interesting and you can see the confusion metrics formed here so again uh, this is also performing poorly because uh, there are six false negatives which is bad and there are two false positives same as the xg boost the decision tree the decision tree classifier also has uh, true false positive and true two false negatives okay and of course it had uh, greater accuracy where we, which we had seen previously now if you see here this part is interesting here you can see the random forest classifier I, and this is the criteria used here is the information gain here you would see that there are zero false negatives which is quite good okay so at least what happens here is uh, there is no false negative so you're not the algorithm is not missing anything so if a person is going to suffer from parkinson it is detecting it without any failures so it obviously has a, a two false positive value, which is not, which is not uh, very wrong because you know, and uh, if uh, the person is, uh, you know, the algorithm detects that okay, this guy is going to suffer from Parkinson's before taking any kind of medication, he would of course consult the doctor. So here it would be saved here, but you know, false negative is really bad. So you're missing something that is really bad. So even for the entropy criteria, you would say that there are zero false negatives. Okay. The SVC has four false negative, which is bad. Now the K nearest neighbors, the K nearest neighbor classifier has zero false positive and zero false negative. So out of all the algorithms that we had seen from the top, the K nearest neighbors has performed the best because it not only has good accuracy, it also has zero false positive and zero false negative values. Okay. So K nearest neighbors classifier is comparatively better than compare compared to all the classifiers that have been used above it. So you can see even Gaussian naive base has uh, five false negatives and one false positive and Bernoulli naive base has even bad performance. It has seven uh, false negatives, right? So which is bad. So from this metrics we can see that k nearest neighbors classifier has performed the best now going through the roc plots we will have an even better idea okay so here you can see the roc for xg boost the area under the curve is one so it 
is almost like you know uh, i'll say it's a very good model because aoc is one but it also indicates certain amount of overfit in the model so we don't really want that to happen and here for logistic regression, you can see the AUC is 0.92. The decision tree has a AUC of 93. You can see the curve is far away. Okay. So just observe that how far the curve is from your, uh, from your line, from your true positive equal to false positive rate line. Okay. So that is something that you need to observe. So here the curve is closer. Here the curve is farther. So the AUC is also greater. And here, of course, the curve is the farthest. So it is the random forest classifier having a UC of one. The entropy also has the UC of one. The KNN has the UC of one as well. Okay. And Gaussian naive base has 0 0.91. And uh, Bernoulli naive base has 0 0.94. Okay. So I would say in terms of ROC, as we had seen previously in terms of the a classification report and in terms of the confusion metrics, the K nearest neighbor algorithm had performed the best. And here also you can see that in terms of ROC as well, the K nearest neighbor has also is performed really well. So I would say the best algorithm which can be chosen for uh, Parkinson's detection is K nearest neighbors. So that would be uh, our conclusion from this particular assignment that we have done. So uh, with this, we come to the end of this project. So to summarize, we have uh, uh, pre we have loaded the data, the Parkinson's data regarding voice and speech. We have pre-processed the data and we have fit the data into various models. We have found out the evaluation metrics. And from the evaluation metrics, we figured out that the best performing model is the K-nearest neighbors. So this is how we perform Parkinson's detection. So that's all for this project. In the uh, in the next project, we'll be coming up with more healthcare related uh, assignments, more healthcare related projects. So see you in the next project. Thank you.